great, marvelous phrase, trampling death by death. And that's what Jesus has done for us, trampled death by death. Near the end of the 19th century, a little church sitting high on the cliffs at the entrance to the English Channel was destroyed uh, by a hurricane. A number of weeks later, an admiral from the English Navy came uh, to that little where the church had been standing and found the pastor and he asked the pastor, are you planning to uh, rebuild your church building? And the pastor said, well, we're a poor church and we don't think that we can afford to rebuild. And the admiral said to the pastor, well, if you can't afford to rebuild, then our seamen will rebuild your church for us. You see, the spire on your church is on all of our charts and maps as the landmark by which our ships steer their way clearly through the English Channel. And that little church is not the only one that serves as a landmark and provides a sign by which people guide their journeys. The cross stands out in many skylines across the United States and all around the world. And today what I wanted to remind us of is that Easter is a landmark too. That Easter and the historical events that it celebrates is the marker by which all other Christian doctrines set sail. The spire of the cross and the hill of the empty tomb stand to this day on the chart of God's Word as the confirmation of our faith. They are the bedrock upon which everything that we believe is founded. Those weeks that surrounded the death and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus must have been the most gut-wrenching weeks that those early followers of Jesus had ever experienced or would ever experience over the course of their lifetime. They went from the joy of following Jesus and listening to Him preach and watching Him do miracles to the despair and the depression that they experienced when Jesus was hung on the cross and died, to the surprise and joy and exultation that they knew when Jesus came forth alive again, to the uncertainty and the question of seeing Jesus ascend back to the Father, go back toward heaven. And they faced all of those various emotions in just a period of about six weeks. Now, I know you and I look back on those events from our vantage point 2,000 years later, and we have the advantage of being able to know that when Jesus hung on the cross, that three days later he was going to rise from the grave again. And we already know that just a few weeks later he's going to ascend from the Mount of Olives back to heaven again. And so when we look at all those events, it is as though it is one whole. And we expect that as we read that story anew and think about those events again. But it was not so for those early followers of Jesus. As they experienced his death for the first time, having no idea that it's coming, although perhaps they should have. Seeing him come alive from the grave again, which they did not anticipate, and watching as he ascended back to the Father. And so I thought it would be good for us this morning just to spend a few minutes considering those emotions that those early followers of Jesus went through in those weeks surrounding the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. And I begin by, by mentioning that Easter is a reminder of the pain and the fear those friends of Jesus felt when he was killed. Because Jesus' friends weren't prepared for Jesus ever to leave them. They thought he would always be with them. You get that idea when you read that account in Matthew 16 of when Jesus predicted that there would come a time when he would be killed and, and the response that the apostles made to that prediction. Matthew records, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, 
and that he must be killed. And on the third day, raised to life. Even with that promise of the resurrection at the end of that prediction, those early followers of Jesus just couldn't believe that he would actually die, couldn't believe that he would actually be killed. You see that when you see Peter's response to what Jesus had just said. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, rebuke Jesus. Never, he said, never, Lord, never will this happen to you. And it wasn't just Peter who felt that way. All of those early followers of Jesus would have felt the same way. All of them would have been shocked to even consider that their Lord would be killed. That their Lord would die. Think just for a moment about what those early followers of Jesus were feeling on that Saturday, the day after Jesus died. It was a cold, gray Saturday morning. I'm not talking about the weather because we don't know anything about what the weather was like. I'm talking about what their hearts were experiencing. It was a cold, gray, dark Saturday morning for them. Just the day before, they had watched the brutal execution of their leader. They'd watched him suffer and his life slowly drift away. The death of Jesus was not this peaceful, calm, end-of-life story because his body was worn out of old age and and he gave up. The death of Jesus was not some heroic act in a moment of time on a battlefield where where he gave his life to save someone else. This was a slow, torturous execution as of a criminal. They saw him as he spoke his final words and breathed his final tortured breaths. They watched as the soldier took the spear and pierced his side to prove that he was dead. They witnessed as his body was lowered from the cross and taken to the tomb. Consider how those early followers of Jesus would have felt. They were heartbroken. They were grief-stricken. They were shocked. They were horrified. They were traumatized. Any of us would have felt the same if someone that we cared about, someone that we knew, had gone through what Jesus had just gone through. They were confused. They didn't understand what was going on. The week before, just a week before, they had walked behind Jesus as he'd rode into Jerusalem on a donkey and the people of the city had raised their palm branches in honor of him and proclaimed him to be their king. They'd walked right behind him and heard the adulation. Those early followers of Jesus, they were convinced that he was the Messiah. They were convinced that he was the one who was going to reestablish Israel, the kingdom of Israel, and bring it to prominence and wealth again. And they were the ones who were waiting to gain their positions right beside the throne of their king. And instead, everything came crashing down on them in a day. As they stood there while Jesus was before Pilate and heard the crowd cry out, Crucify Him! Crucify Him! They watched the whole affair. As Pilate washed his hands, As the soldiers drug Jesus to the hill as he died. On Friday, those early followers of Jesus may still have felt some hope. Perhaps they had the hope that while he was standing before Pilate, he'd put Pilate in his place. Maybe they had the hope that as he was being drugged toward Calvary, that he would break free. The hope that as he hung on the cross that Perhaps he would work another miracle and come down. But now we're to Saturday. And all hope is gone. Jesus is dead. And those early followers were confused, depressed, alone, forsaken. But Easter is more than just about the pain and the fear those early disciples of Jesus felt. 
Easter is also a reminder of the surprise and joy of Jesus' friends as he came back to life again. Oliver Cromwell ruled uh, England, and when he ruled England, a young soldier was brought before a military court and tried, and he was sentenced to be shot by the firing squad when curfew bell rang that night. During that military rule of Cromwell, at every night at 8 o'clock in the evening, the cathedral bell would ring as a sign of curfew that everybody was to be in their houses and all the streets were to be quiet. But on the, that night, the curfew bell didn't ring. Instead, only muffled noises came from the bell tower at curfew hour. When the soldiers, Cromwell's soldiers, climbed to the top of the bell tower, what they found there was that young man, condemned man's fiance, who had strapped herself to that giant clapper on the bell. So that all that was heard when the rope was pulled was the body of that woman being thrown against the side of the bell between the clapper and the bell. The soldiers removed her bruised and bloody body and took her to Oliver Cromwell. And he, she, he was so impressed with her willingness to suffer on behalf of her fiancé that he set the fiancé free. And he declared, curfew shall not ring tonight. It was her bruised and bloody body that turned sorrow and desperation into joy for the soldier and for his fiance. And it is the bruised and bloody body of Jesus that turned the day of distress and despair and confusion of so and sorrow into the next day of surprise and joy and adulation that Jesus was alive again. Easter is the joy of relationship when Mary Magdalene went to the garden tomb, she brought with her those things that she needed in order to help prepare Jesus' body for its long time that it was to lay there in the tomb. She was expecting to care for the dead body of Jesus. But when she got to the garden tomb, the seal in the tomb had been broken, and the stone had been rolled away, and she was met there, not by the dead body of Jesus, but rather by living angels who spoke to her and said, You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He is risen, and he is not here. Instead of the lifeless body of Jesus, she turned and met the living Jesus. Although she didn't know who he was there in the garden, she thought perhaps he was just a gardener. And so he spoke to Mary the first words that Jesus spoke after he rose from the grave, at least the first recorded words that he spoke after he rose from the grave. He said to Mary, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Now, she didn't recognize him. She didn't know who he was. But the very next word that came from his mouth was a word of recognition. And when he spoke that one word, she immediately knew who he was. The next word that came from Jesus' mouth was her name. Mary, he said. It was a word of relationship. It was a word that Mary longed to hear. Jesus knew her. He knew her name. He knew all about her. And John records that when Jesus spoke the name of Mary, Mary wrapped her arms around him and clung to him. You see, Mary wasn't thinking, Wow, Jesus is alive. I better run and tell everybody I can. She wasn't thinking, wow, Jesus is alive. I wonder what that means. Wow, Jesus is alive. It's a tremendous power. Wow, Jesus is alive. Maybe that means I'll live forever. That's not what she was thinking. She was just thinking, Jesus is alive. And I, bought a, I want to be with him. Simply because she loved him. Easter is the joy of relationship. And the emotion that Mary felt as she clung to Jesus there in the garden is the same emotion that every one of the early followers of Jesus felt when they saw him again after he rose from the dead. They just were glad he was back. 
They were just thrilled that he was with them. Easter is the joy of hope, too. For them, the resurrection was the hope that there was life beyond the grave. There are millions of people who, who live without that kind of hope. They are the living dead. They walk in this world as though life is a mockery and a sham to them. They, life has lost its meaning and its purpose. They have no hope. They're bored and they, they're fed up. They have no zest for living their lives. And I've seen people like that who come to Jesus in simple faith, and when they put their trembling hands into the strong hands of a living Christ, I've seen them step out of the casket of their broken hopes and their broken dreams and begin to live lives filled with purpose and meaning and power and hope. Easter is the joy of hope. It's the hope and the certainty that Jesus is God's Son. I mean, think about some of the things that Jesus had declared when he taught in those years in which he was walking in this world. I mean, he taught that, that, that he was going to build a kingdom, that he was a king. He taught that the devil and the demons would submit to him. He taught that every knee would bow, that all men would one day submit to him. He taught that he would be with them always that he was going to take them to where he was with the father he said that you will have life that you will have eternity that you will have forgiveness all those things are the bold declarations that jesus made in his ministry of teaching and all of those were faced with uncertainty when jesus died because what certainty can you cling to when the one who has spoken the declarations is no longer alive? Easter returned the certainty to the hopes and stamped them with the mark of God's power. Is there any hope? That's the constant question of all humanity. And Easter is the surest answer. Easter is the joy of hope. Easter is the joy of power. And the Apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. He said to them, I'm sorry, verses 18 through 20. He said to them, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, Paul said, there is an incomparably great power that is available for you and for me. That power is God's own mighty working power, and it's available to help us. It's available to change us. It's available to give us life after death. God's power is available to us. And then Paul says this startling thing, that power that's available to you and me, that power of God that's at work in our lives, he says it's the same power, the exact same power that God used when he raised Jesus from the dead. That power is at work in your life and in mine. Before the resurrection, Peter stood outside the courtyard while Jesus was being tried. And he was terrified. Now, he was there in the courtyard, and so that says something positive about Peter. But, but although he was there, he was terrified. And when a slave girl said she thought he'd been with Jesus, he denied it. Three times he denied it. Because he was terrified. He was afraid they'd do to him what they were doing to Jesus. They'd put him on trial. They'd convict him of some crime. They'd put him on a cross. He was terrified. And he ran away. Just a few weeks later, that same Peter stood in front of every authority in Jerusalem those same powerful men who had condemned Jesus to death, 
those same powerful men who'd taken Jesus to Pilate and asked Pilate to have him crucified, those same powerful men who turned against Jesus, now Peter stood in front of them and he pointed his finger at them and with boldness he said to them, you crucified the Lord. What changed for Peter? From a terrified man unwilling to even tell a slave girl that he followed Jesus to one who was willing to stand in front of every authority and declare that they had killed the Lord was the incomparably great power of God that was at work in Peter's life. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead changed Peter radically in just a few short weeks. Peter is exhibit number one in a long list of exhibits that demonstrate the power of God to change the lives of men and women. And there are millions of other exhibits. And some of them are sitting in this room at this very moment. Lives radically changed by the incomparably great power of God. That same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Lord Nelson wrote home after the Battle of the Nile, and he said, Victory is not a name strong enough for such a scene, and we would declare that today. Victory is not a name strong enough for what we experience through Jesus Christ and the incomparably great power of God that is at work within our lives, that same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Easter is the joy of power. And one more reminder, that Easter is a reminder of the longing Jesus' friends felt to be with him again. For 40 days, Jesus met with his followers after his resurrection, and they enjoyed several opportunities to be with him. He met with Mary there in the garden tomb just after he had raised from the dead. There were other women that gathered as well, and he met with them. There was the time when he was walking along the road to the village outside of Jerusalem and talking to a couple of his followers along the road. He met with ten of the apostles in the upper room. Thomas wasn't there at that time, and he met with all eleven again. The next week he met with some of his followers by the shore of the Sea of Galilee and he fixed breakfast for them. And those are just a handful of the times when Jesus met with those who were his followers after he rose from the dead. There are more, some that are alluded to in other parts of the scripture like that time in 1 Corinthians 15 that talks about when Jesus met with 500 people all at once. We don't know all the resurrection appearances that Jesus made to those who were his followers. Those must have been some amazing few weeks. They'd gone from the depths of despair to the heights of joy. And now to have opportunity after opportunity to meet with Jesus, to be with Jesus. Surely they, they, they thought this was going to go on forever. I mean, he'd faced the worst thing that could happen to him. They'd put him to death. And he came back to life again. There was nothing else that could take Jesus away. He'd be with them forever. And then in a moment of time, he floated up off the Mount of Olives and into the clouds. The first time, it was Pilate and the Jewish leaders who'd taken him away by hanging him on the cross. This time, it was God who'd taken him away, ascended him back to heaven. The book of Acts says, And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them hit him from their sight. I mean, imagine how they would have felt that day. Six weeks with Jesus is not what they wanted. They wanted the rest of their lives with Jesus. They wanted all eternity with Jesus. They never wanted to leave his presence. You get that idea when you hear how they responded when Jesus was lifted up from them right there on the Mount of Olives. The scripture says they were looking intently into the sky as he was going, and suddenly two men dressed in white, stood before them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking in the sky? You get the idea that the apostles, the followers of Jesus, as they watched Jesus ascend back through the clouds, they were just standing there as though they were welded to the spot. They didn't know what to think. Maybe they were hoping that it was just a, a, a brief trip up and back and he'd be right back. 
They didn't know what to think. So they stood there, welded to the ground, watching the clouds, hoping that he'd come through them again. And then the angel gave this promise. This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. He wasn't coming back right then. But the promise was that there would be a day when he would come back again. And from that day, for the rest of their lives, they kept their eyes on the clouds. Now, I'm not saying they camped on a mountaintop and waited for him to come back. They, they kept doing what he told them to do. They did it with all their energy. They kept working. But all the time they were working, all the time they were doing the things that God told them to do, they kept their eye on the sky, hoping that they'd see Jesus come through the clouds again. And why were they wanting to see him so badly? Well, I don't think it was just so they'd get a reward. I don't think it was just so they could go to heaven. I don't think it was just so they could have eternal life. I don't think it was just so they could sit on a throne. Maybe all those were some of the reasons why they kept their eye on the sky. But you know the real reason, the primary reason those early followers of Jesus kept their eye peeled on the sky? Because they just wanted to see him. They just wanted to be with him. They loved him that much. Easter is the reminder that Jesus is coming again. Easter is a love story. And every year we talk about how Easter and all the things that surround Easter show us so clearly that God loves us. And that's a great thing for us to remember. God loves us so much that he sent Jesus to the cross and he, he sacrificed his life so that I can have forgiveness and you can have forgiveness and we can have a, a relationship with God. And he loves us so much that he raised Jesus back to life again so that we can have the assurance that we can have life too, that, 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 that death can trample death, that, that life is ours again. He loves us so much that he promised that Jesus is coming again so that we can be with him forever. So Easter is a love story. It's about how much God loves us. But what I really wanted to remind us of this morning is that Easter is also a love story because it reminds us of how much we should love God. It reminds us of how much those early followers of Jesus loved Jesus. Those early followers of Jesus loved him so much, their hearts were broken when he died. Those early followers of Jesus loved him so much that they were filled with joy when he came back to life again. Those early followers of Jesus loved Jesus so much that they watched the clouds waiting anxiously for him to return. So Easter is a love story. It's a love story about how much those early followers of Jesus loved him. And Easter is an invitation to you and me to love Jesus like that too. Easter is not a story that says, come to God, submit to him because you're afraid. Easter is not a story that says, cower before his power. Easter is a story that says, he loves you. So love him in return. Love him so much that your heart is broken by the death that he died for you. Recognizing that your sins put him out on that cross just as much as the sins of those leaders of the Jews who condemned him. Just as much as the sins of Pilate who sent him to his death. Just as much as the sins of those soldiers who nailed him to the cross and watched him die. Your sins put him on the cross too. So love him so much that your heart is broken because he died for you. And love him so much because he conquered death and came to life again. Be, lo love him so much that you're overjoyed at the resurrection. Overjoyed that not even death can keep him down. Overjoyed 
that he's put the stamp of God and the stamp of eternity on our relationship with him. And love him so much that we watch the clouds. Anxiously waiting for him to return. Not camping out on a mountainside, but keeping doing what he asks us to do. But all the time we do what he asks us to do, we keep an eye on the clouds. Anxiously waiting for him to come back. Not just so that we can go to heaven. Not just so that we could sit on a throne. Not just so that we'll have eternal life, although all of those things will be ours. But mostly, just because we want to be with him. Just because we love him. Easter is a love story. It's God's invitation to you and me to love him back. If you don't have that kind of love relationship with Jesus Christ, then God invites you to enter into that love relationship with him at this very moment in the sincerity and simplicity of your own heart and in your own words just simply to respond to Jesus who is alive just simply to respond to him to let him know that you love him or maybe you're here this morning and you've already entered into that love relationship with Jesus but that love has grown cool or maybe even cold. This is God's invitation to renew that love relationship with Him. Again, in the sincerity and simplicity of your own heart to come back to the place where you love Him. We're going to sing a song now. It's a declaration that Jesus is alive a declaration that sadness has turned to joy. A declaration that Jesus is alive and so it's a happy day. And as we sing, I would just invite you to think about your own relationship with God. To enter into that love relationship with Jesus for the first time, if you've never done that. To renew that love relationship with Him if that's what your need is. And if you're making a decision today, either a first-time decision to enter into a relationship with Jesus or a renewal of that relationship with Jesus, there's a decision card right in the chair in front of you. And I just invite you to take that decision card and fill it out. Hand it to me. I'll be at the door on your way out or any one of our staff will be in the foyer or just drop it at the Welcome Center because we'd love to help you in any way that we can as you enter into a love relationship with Jesus and learn to, to grow and love Him more and more the coming weeks, the coming days. There are also some folks that are available to pray with you. If you'd like somebody to pray with you, they're in our prayer room. If you get to our prayer room, you just go out into the four-year turn to your right and go down by the bathrooms, and the prayer room is right next to those. And there's somebody there who'd be happy to pray with you and answer any questions that you have about how you can enter into that love relationship with Jesus too.